the Book of Mormon as the keystone of our religion and uh, the idea of Zion. And now we want to come to the subject of the prophetic vision. I'd like to begin by uh, calling your attention again to some of the statements that President Benson has made. He's uh, given some very positive and pointed statements in relation to uh, the last days and our responsibility in connection with the last days. One of them, he says, Watchmen, uh, let's go back a paragraph prior to that. Repentance, he says, was, cry, was the cry of our late and great prophet Spencer W. Kimball. This thing permeated his talks and the pages of his writings, such as his marvelous book, The Miracle of Forgiveness. And it must be our cry today, both to member and to non-member alike, repent. Watchmen, he says, what of the night? We must respond by saying that, it, that all is not well in Zion. As Moroni counseled, we must cleanse the inner vessel, beginning first with ourselves, then with our families, and finally with the Church. The prophet of God stated, Ye shall clean away the bad according as the good shall grow, until the good shall overcome the bad. Now there's one bit of counsel by President Benson. Here's another one. And here he cites several other earlier brethren. He says, Considering some of the challenges which the Church faces currently, and which it will continue to face in the future, Three statements of former Church leaders come to mind. There are at least three dangers that threaten the Church within. He's quoting here President Joseph F. Smith. There are flattery of prominent men in the world, false educational ideas, and sexual impurity. These three dangers are of greater concern today than they, were, uh, than they were when identified by President Smith. A second statement was a prophecy of Heber C. Kimball, counselor to President Brigham Young, speaking to members of the Church who had come to the Salt Lake Valley, he said, to meet the difficulties that are coming, it will be necessary for you to have a knowledge of the truth of this work, and this for yourselves. The difficulties will be of such a character that the man or woman who does not possess this personal knowledge or witness will fall. If you have not got the testimony, light, and, and light of the Lord in your life, He says, then you will fall. If you do not, you cannot stand. The time will come when no man or woman will be able to endure on borrowed light. Each will have to be guided by the light within himself. If you don't have it, you will not stand. Therefore seek for the testimony of Jesus and cleave to it, and when the trying times come, uh, you may not stumble and fall. Now, the third statement, he says, is from President Harold B. Lee. My boyhood, my boyhood companion and friend, and eleventh president of the Church. Quote, we have some tight places to go before the Church is through with before the Lord rather is through with the Church and the world in this dispensation, which is the last dispensation, which will usher in the coming of the Lord. The gospel was restored to prepare a people ready to receive him. The power of Satan will increase. We see it in evidence on every hand. There will be inroads within the Church. We will see that those who profess membership but secretly are plotting and trying to lead the people not to follow the leadership that the Lord has set up to preside in his Church. Now, the only safety we have as members of this Church is to do exactly what the Lord uh, said to the Church in that day when the Church was organized. We must learn to give heed to the words and commandments 
that the Lord shall give through his prophet, as he receiveth him, walk ye in all holiness before me, saith the Lord. He says, There will be some times, some things rather, that will, that will take patience and, uh, uh, and faith. You may not like what comes from the authority of the Church, but if you listen to these things, as if from the mouth of the Lord himself, with patience and faith, the promise is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord will disperse the power of darkness from before you, and cause the heavens to shake for your good and for his name's glory. Now it seems to me that we have those within, uh, that we have within these three principal statements and prophetic statements the counsel we need, the counsel that is necessary to stay valiant in our testimony of Jesus and of the work of his Church in these troubled times. One who rationalizes that he or she has a testimony of Jesus Christ but cannot accept direction and counsel from the leadership of his Church is in a fundamentally unsound position and is in jeopardy of losing exaltation. Now, these are two statements by the President of the Church, President Ezra Taft Benson. Let me just give you one more. He says, We may expect to see the righteousness of the saints and the progress of the kingdom of God continue unabated, but it will not be without opposition. The Council of the Twelve proclaimed in 1845, and this is that famous Declaration of the Twelve written by the Commander of the Lord, as this work progresses in its onward course, and I'm quoting, or he is, from this uh, proclamation, and becomes more and more an object of political and religious interest. No king, ruler, or subject, no community or individual will stand neutral. All will be influenced by one spirit or the other, and will take sides either for or against the kingdom of God. He says, Yes, as the Lord declared, Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness. Her borders must be enlarged, her stakes must be strengthened. As righteousness will increase, so will evil. We see evidences of this all about it. It sometimes causes members of the Church to do to despair. We may be assured, however, that the Lord will take care of this in his own time and in his own way. Hear his decree, quoting now from uh, section 63, I have sworn my wrath and decreed wars upon the face of the earth, and the wicked shall slay the wicked, and fear shall come upon every man. And the saints also shall hardly escape. Nevertheless, I, the Lord, am with them, and will come down in heaven from the presence of my Father, and consume the wicked with unquenchable fire. We may not uh, be too far, President Benson then says, from the day prophesied by Heber C. Kimball, father of President Spencer W. Kimball, grandfather of President Spencer W. Kimball, a member of the First Presidency, the saints, President Kimball, or Heber C. Kimball said, will be put to the test that will try the integrity of the best of them. The pressure will become so great that the uh, more righteous among them will cry unto the Lord day and night until the deliverance comes. But remember, the Lord has said in modern revelation, if ye are prepared, ye need not fear. Now, with this in mind, my brothers and sisters, the uh, living prophet today has given us special warnings of judgments and special counsel. And this is part of the, of the gospel program. We've never had a dispensation of the gospel on earth that didn't carry with it also the proclamation of judgments. You go back and read the history, for example, uh, of the Lord's people in the days of Enoch, of the Lord's people in the days of Noah, of the Lord's people with Abraham, of the Lord's people with Israel. It just comes right on down that apparently inseparably associated with the restoration of a new dispensation or the institution of a new dispensation is also the voice of warning, and among other things, the doctrine of covenants is such a voice. It's uh, not only the capstone of our religion, but it is certainly a voice of warning to a modern world. Uh, President Benson, dealing with this, says, uh, Too often we bask in our comfortable complacency and rationalize that the ravages of war, economic disaster, famine, and earthquake cannot happen here. 
Those who believe this are either not acquainted with the revelations of the Lord, or they do not believe them. Those who smugly think them, that these calamities will not happen, that they uh, somehow will be set aside because of the righteousness of the saints, are deceived and will rue the day they harbor such delusion. The Lord has warned and forewarned us against a day of great tribulation and given us counsel through his servants on how we can be prepared for these difficult times. Have we heeded, he asked, these counsels? And then this statement from President Benson, the world will uh, present a scene of conflict such as has never been experienced before. Still men's hearts will be hardened to the revelations from heaven. Even greater signs shall then be given to manifest the approaching uh, great day of the Lord. And they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. And they shall behold blood and fire and vapors of smoke. And before the day of the Lord shall come, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon be turned to blood, and the stars fall from heaven. He says, I realize this is an unpleasant topic on which to dwell. I take no delight in its portrayal, nor do I look forward to the day when calamity shall come upon mankind. But these words are not my own. The Lord has spoken them. Knowing what we know as his servants, can we hesitate to raise a warning voice to all who will listen that they may be prepared for the days ahead? Silence in the face of such calamity is sin. Now, in that sense, then, let's, let's talk about Zion, because Zion is to be a place of refuge. As the Lord says in section 45, as he speaks of a, a future day, uh, when the new Jerusalem is built, he says it will be called, and this is section 45, verse 66, a land uh, of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. Those terms are meaningful as he expresses them, and uh, we need then to, to give them heed, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety. So let's, let's just spend a little time here then on the, the idea of Zion. And let me go back to some of the things that we discussed this afternoon and uh, make clear that we're not merely talking about... Uh, some theory and some idea, but we're talking about a body of people who are alive in Christ, where the powers of the Holy Spirit permeate their midst, and when they are quickened and enlightened by the gifts and the blessings of the gospel, and uh, where they see things then in the light of the Lord's Spirit and feel things in the light of his love. Now, first of all, Zion is built on a spiritual principle. You say, how can we prepare? And uh, yes, we're counseled to have a year's supply. But the most important preparation is spiritual. And those people who merely prepare in the sense of temporal things will find that the very things that they hoard will be the things that invite and incite opposition against them. The primary thing the primary thing is a spiritual preparation. And this means then coming to the Lord with that kind of faith where we begin to walk in the light of his Spirit and where uh, we begin to love the brethren and we begin to truly sustain the prophet with our whole hearts and souls. Now, in section 29 of the Document Covenants, the Lord here talks about uh, the commandments he has given unto the people, and he says in verse 34, Therefore, verily I say unto you, that all things unto me are spiritual, and not at any time have I given to you a law that was temporal, neither any man nor the children of men, neither Adam your father whom I created. Now you say, well, tithing, spiritual principle, and the answer is yes. The welfare program, a spiritual principle, and the answer is yes. The requirement to uh, uh, prepare and have a year's supply, a spiritual principle, and the answer is yes. The Lord has never, nor will he ever, give a temporal commandment. 
All of these are spiritual, and they need to see, be seen in that light. There needs to be a, a context established. It isn't just that, we're, that we belong to the Quran's Club, and we've decided now to prepare for adversities that are coming. We are of those people whom the Lord has chosen to build Zion, and Zion primarily is a spiritual program. And everything that we do then has that basis and that orientation. Now, another requirement as we see Zion, first of all, it is a spiritual program. Secondly, it requires a willing mind and a willing heart. And uh, this attitude and this disposition then is, is very vital. Here, for example, in section 64 of the Doctrine of Covenants, the Lord makes this statement, verse uh, 33 and 34, Wherefore, be not weary in well-doing, for you are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceed of that which is great. Behold, the Lord requires the heart and the willing mind, and the willing and the obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. Now, along with a willing heart and a willing mind is an attitude uh, of esteeming each other as our own selves. The Christian law is not that we become walking mats and that we just uh, allow people to walk over us unrestricted. Read section 98 on that. It tells you the limitations of that kind of approach. And that doesn't go on and on. But the Christian law is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, as is not better and it's not less. The Christian law is that you put yourself in the other person's position when you are contracting a deal, and that you transact that deal with as much interest in him or her as you do with ourselves. I remember when I was a young man and uh, uh, I was out trying to raise money to get on back to Syracuse University to uh, get an education, and uh, the Lord blessed me in that. I had three hundred dollars and. Uh, the beginning of the spring, and uh, everything I touched turned to gold, <laughs> literally did. But in the course of that experience, the Lord gave me one experience that I have uh, continued to think about over the years. I went to a neighbor who had some cattle for the purpose of buying a particular animal. This was uh, uh, a Holstein heifer. And I was just buying and selling. As I said, when I got that fall, I had, to, I had more money than I thought I could get. But I talked to the brother in the family, and they had contracted a deal with him. And as I was walking out of the backyard through uh, the lot where the house was standing, the good sister came out of the home and said, I'd like to talk with you. And uh, she says, Do you know? this and this and this about that animal. And uh, they were negative things. And uh, fortunately for her, for the whole thing, her husband had well informed me about that. He didn't let that go. So that in that transaction they considered my interest as though they were the buyer. See, and I always thought of that as one of the examples uh, of uh, a good neighbor and of living the Christian law. Now, the Christian law requires that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And in the great revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord sought to prepare the saints for the law of consecration, and I have reference now to section 38 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is the first revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants preparing the saints specifically for the law of Zion. And he says this, verse 24, Let every man esteem his brother as himself, and practice virtue and holiness before me. And again, a note he repeats it, And again I say unto you, Let every man esteem his brother as himself, and then he bolsters and fortifies though that statement repeated twice with this parable. 
What man among you, having twelve sons, and is no respecter of them, and they serve him obediently? And he saith unto the one, Be thou clothed in robes, and sit thou here, and to the other, Be thou clothed in rags, and sit thou there, and looketh upon his sons, and saith, I am just. Behold, the Lord said, This I have given you as a parable, and it is even as I am. I say unto you, Be one, and if ye are not one, ye are not mine. Now, the oneness that he's talking about here is the oneness based on the Christian law of loving our neighbors as ourselves. And it's the basic foundation of the law of Zion, to be that honest and considerate of other people. Now, this is then another requirement. Now, keep in mind also that uh, Zion is founded on her mount, as we talked about this afternoon. Now, her mount is the temple. Now, that means that Zion is founded upon the sacred covenants of the house of the Lord, of obedience and of sacrifice and of the law of the gospel. And some people say, well, what's the law of the gospel? And the answer to that is the Sermon on the Mount, that law that requires us to, to forgive our enemies and to love them, that law that requires us to be so pure that we do not look with lust on someone else, that law that requires us not even to be angry, let alone to commit some overt act, not even to be angry against our neighbors. See? Now, you can't come to that law without spiritual renewal. It just can't be done. You may will to do so in your mind that the Sermon on the Mount is not a practical law for the world. It's only practical for those people who have been renewed in Christ and who are filled with his love and who have his law engraven upon their hearts and who have that so firmly grounded in their lives that they act on that principle, and it then becomes a very meaningful thing in that way. All right, uh, it also requires us to obey then the law of virtue and the law of consecration and so forth. And in this sense, then, Zion is, is to be founded. Let me put it this way. Zion is the unfolding of gospel covenants. Zion is some, not something different from the gospel. Zion is an extension of the gospel. It's the, it's the blossoming of the gospel. It's the unfolding, the development of gospel life, and the extension of those basic principles of the gospel into the practical world, to not only sanctify ourselves, but to sanctify the world and our whole community, so that in the end, not only can we be endowed with the powers of the Spirit, but as section 124 says, you can endow Zion and all her municipals with the Spirit. Now, for example, the covenant of consecration is merely an extension of the covenant of baptism. In the covenant of baptism, you give yourself to Christ. In the covenant of consecration, you take this thing out of your back pocket and you put it right there and say, Lord, there it is. Now, one, then, is merely the extension of the other. One, then, is merely the extension. And uh, in baptism, then, we commit to take upon ourselves the name of Christ and to act as he would act and to seek his spirit. In consecration, we consecrate our time, our talents, and all that we possess to Christ. And this, then, to the proposition that his divine and holy order will economically institute an order of things where we love our neighbor as ourselves, and where each person in the program of consecration and stewardship will have an equal right and an equal opportunity to acquire and to enjoy the good things of this life. And so you consecrate them to the proposition of social equality and economic equality. And it's that kind of thing. Now, for example, in baptism, we obtain a remission of sins. Now, there is such a thing as retaining a remission of sins from day to day. When my favorite number two son was eight years of age, that summer we had contracted to go to Hawaii and teach at the church college. 
Knowing that he was going to turn eight years of age while we were there, we got the permission from our bishop to uh, perform the ordinance of baptism there in the ocean in Hawaii. And so as that day arrived, we and a few friends uh, donned our white pants and white shirt and headed down to the beach, bright and early in the morning when no one else was around. And there on the beach at Laie, while we had a nice, beautiful baptismal service. And then uh, he and I walked out into the water waist deep, and it was there that uh, we baptized him. <clears throat> now, on the way back to where we were living, as we walked hand in hand, he looked up at me and he said, Daddy, he says, you know I need to be baptized twice. And it didn't dawn on me at first what he was really driving at. And so I answer, ask him, well, now, how so? Don't you think this, is, this one's any good? And he says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, well, what, what do you mean, then, by I ought to be baptized twice? And he says, well, I need to be baptized now, and then I need to be baptized just before I die. Now, you knew what he had on his mind in the crack of the way. And I says, now, why so? And he said, well, so I can get a remission of sins now, and so I can be sure to have a remission of sins when I go back to Heavenly Father. Now, that is planning ahead for you. So it required me then to go into another dimension of the gospel, and that is simply this, that there is a divine program designed to give us the remission of sins, that is, by which we can obtain a remission of sins. That program is to have faith in Christ, to repent, and to be baptized by one having proper authority in the proper way. Now, there is a scriptural program that's designed to carry that action and that benefit with us every day, so that every evening as we go to bed or retire to our beds at night, you can be just as though you had been baptized prior to retiring. Now, there is a program of that nature, and it's called that divine program by which we can retain a remission of sins from day to day. Let me recommend to you Mosiah chapter 4, where the great King Benjamin, in his discourse to the saints in his day, I only gave him the law required to be renewed and regenerated from the natural man state where we're enemies to God, but uh, to put off the natural man and become saints. But then went further and talked to them about how they can, he says, retain, and I'm quoting from verse 12, a remission of your sins and grow in the knowledge of the glory of him that created you or in the knowledge of that which is just and true. And then he deals with some of the specific points, and the basic idea is that we take upon ourselves the name of Christ and we actually follow through and emulate him and do as he would do and conduct our lives on that plane. And so he says, verse 13, you will not have a mind to injure one another, but to live peaceably and to render to every man according to that which is his due. Now, here again is the Christian law to love your neighbor as yourself, not better, and certainly not less. He says, And you will not suffer your children that they go hungry or naked. Neither will you suffer that they transgress the laws of God and fight and quarrel one with another. When they're really cutting it up, and it's a real cut-up, your remission of sins is going down the tube if you haven't fulfilled your responsibility. That's what he's saying. He says, but you will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. You will teach them to love one another and to serve one another. He says, and also you yourselves will succor those that stand in need of your succor. You will administer of your substance to him that standeth in need, and you will not suffer the beggar to put up his petition to you in vain. And then he continues on that theme in his explanation, and the great summary statement is in verse 26 as he summarizes and ties things together in a clear and concise statement. He says, Now for the sake of these things which I have spoken unto you, 
that is, for the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that you may walk guiltless before God. Now, what has he said there? He said that you can retain a remission of sins from day to day, so that you walk guiltless, so that as we retire at night, we are as though we had been baptized immediately before getting under the covers. That's what he's saying. And you can do that. You see, you can do that. Now, he says, in order to do that, then, I would that you should impart of your substance to the poor, to those that have need, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and administering to their relief, both spiritually, and that's home teaching, brethren, both spiritually and temporally, according to their wants. Now, I see a person who wantonly and in a flagrant way sets aside his responsibility as a home teacher. I just chalk it down that the remission of sins for that person is wavering in the balance. When I see a person then who fails to pay his fast offering and to contribute to the welfare program, I simply chalk it up to the fact that that person is not fully covered by the benefits of Christ's atonement. And it's that kind of thing that we see as we see the correlation now between the gospel program and the economic program of Zion. Now, for example, in section 104 of the Doctrine and the Covenants, the Lord is talking about his preparations on this earth to sustain the human family and how well he's done it and how if we were to act on proper principles, there would be no poverty on earth. He says, verse 14, I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things they enter mine. And it is my purpose to provide for my saints, for all things are mine, but it must needs be done in mine own way. And behold, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for my saints, that the poor should be exalted and the rich be made low through their consecrations. He says, For the earth is full, and there is enough and to spare. Yea, I have prepared all things, and have given unto the children of man to be agents unto themselves. Therefore, and here is the punchline, Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion according to the law of my gospel. Now, there is a gospel law that requires imparting substance to those who are in need. He says, if any man then take of the goodness and depart not of his portion according to the law of my gospel unto the poor and the needy, he shall with the wicked lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment. Now, why? Because he has no access to the atonement of Christ. Retaining a remission of sins is a thing of the past for him. He's on his own. And under those circumstances, a person then who does not live the law that requires sensitivity to the needs of the poor and the ministry that is required spiritually as well as temporally, that person who neglects that cuts himself off from the atonement. Now, it's on that basis, my brothers and sisters, that the gospel program unfolds to the Zion program. The economic program is not different than the spiritual program. All things are spiritual. And then the end results uh, tie in with the gospel. When a person uh, complies with the sacred ordinance of baptism, they, they obtain the remission of sins. When they comply then with the law to retain the remission of sins, then they are clean and free. Not because they've walked righteously all day long. They may have made some mistakes and that kind of thing if they made uh, wherein they do not sin willfully, but it's a matter of the weakness of the flesh and the disposition and so forth, then the mercy of Christ still has effect upon them. But in addition to that, then they have the gifts and the blessings and the powers of the Spirit. I remember once reading section 46 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is one of the three statements in Scripture on the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And uh, as I read this and read the first part of it, my heart dropped out and I despaired and said, hey, I haven't got a prayer of a chance. I don't have a prayer of a chance for the gifts. And then I read a little further on. 
Note what he says here, beginning with verse 8. Wherefore, beware, lest ye are deceived, and that ye may not be deceived. Seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering for what they are given. For verily I say unto you, they are given for the benefit of those who love and keep all my commandments. Now there is where my heart dropped out from under me. And then I read on. And him that seeketh so to do. And that's a tremendous little statement. And him who seeketh so to do. If a person's heart is right before the Lord, if a person's intent is right, and they're struggling honestly and manfully against weaknesses, and they don't quite measure up, are they denied the Lord's mercy? And the answer is no. Are they denied his gifts? And the answer is no. See? Now, the point out of this that I would like to make, the whole thing, is this, that the gospel is here not just to be a Sunday religion. It's here to transform our lives. It's here to be extended into our social relationships. It's here to be extended into our economic affairs. And it's here to extend into the political life, to sanctify society, and to give us then that foundation spiritually that's necessary for Zion to become an ensign in the standards of the world. And so it's not proper, as many people do, to put the religion in one pocket and their daily activities in another pocket. That kind of philosophy and attitude leads to damnation and hell. Rather, instead, meet the challenge of integrating the gospel into your life. When I was back at Syracuse, I served there as a member of the district presidency to a man that I grew dearly to love. He had a sixth grade education and just massacred the King's English. And uh, yet when that man spoke, the power of the Spirit just literally radiated. He just bristled with the Spirit. And there was a strength and a power in that man that uh, I just literally envied. He was in tune enough with the Lord that the Spirit of Revelation was with him, and he walked and acted and talked in that. He was raised as an orphan boy and with another family, and he got a call from uh, the people concerned that his uh, foster mother, if you want to call her, was in the hospital and wasn't expected to live till morning. He hopped on the plane, headed to Florida, went to see her in the hospital, laid his hands on her, gave her a blessing, and turned around and hopped on the plane and came back. And in the process, people followed him and said, What you're doing? And he says, I'm going back to Syracuse. And they just literally delighted him. Well, she's going to die. And he says, No, she won't die. In fact, she's going to leave the hospital very soon and be up and around. He headed on back. The next word he got, but the next day she was out of the hospital and home. Now, he was a man of power, spiritual power, but he also integrated the gospel into his business. He was head of the uh, truck division of Brazil Chevrolet, which was the largest truck uh, Chevrolet truck distribution center of central western New York. And people would come for miles to deal with that man. And when they came in, they would say, we will not deal with anyone but Jimmy Jameson. Why? We know he's honest. We know that he will treat us as though he was treating himself. And uh, I've seen people just come literally for miles to deal with him, to transact business for him. When he finally passed away, died of a heart attack, the whole city of Syracuse closed down for one day in honor of Jimmy Jameson. Businesses closed up, and uh, the city closed down. Now, there was a man who brought the gospel into his life, and who, with a sixth grade education, who mastered the King's English, but who had a character and a spiritual power that I, that I envy, and uh, who had the uh, a love for people and a respect for them, uh, and they for him, so that on their own, he a morning, they would close down the town or the city, 
because he had passed away in memory of him. See? Now, the gospel is that kind of thing, but it needs a spiritual underpinning. And uh, this is very well exemplified in the uh, efforts the saints made in the early days of the church to establish Zion. They uh, went down to Jackson County beginning in the summer of 1831. People began to pour in to the county. They began to build homes, uh, lay out farms, establish themselves. And before July of 1840 or 1834 transpired, they were out of the county as uh, strangers and wanderers in the world without a place to live. And uh, under those circumstances, then the Lord instructed the prophet Joseph Smith to gather up the strength of Zion and to go on that famous march that we call the Zion's Camp March. And uh, that group of men then left the Kirtland area, went on down to Jackson County, Missouri. When they got there, they'd had the pledge of the governor that if they could uh, muster enough force and, and supporting power to retain themselves on their lands, that he would reinstitute the saints and bring them back to their lands. But when uh, they got there, then Governor Dunkland had a change of mind. Politically, someone got to him. And he reneged then on his commitment, and since he wouldn't do anything, Zion's camp had to be disbanded. But in the midst of that, then, the Lord gave the saints a revelation there at Fishing River. And uh, in that revelation, he makes some very significant statements. I'd like you to read this now with me in light of this idea that while they're dealing with temporal things and practical things, and they're dealing with trying to institute the law of consecration and stewardship, there is a spiritual uh, element, foundation, and uh, uh, power associated with that, without which they could not do what the Lord wanted them to do. Now note what he says in verse 9, beginning. Now note what he says in verse 9, beginning. Therefore, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. This is where he canceled out the program. Section 105. Uh, we're on verse 10 now. That they themselves may be prepared, and that my people may be taught more perfectly, and have experience, and know perfect, more perfectly, concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. Now note this. And this cannot be brought to pass until my elders are endowed with power from on high. Now what cannot be brought to pass? The thing he talks about in the previous verse, that they might uh, have experience no more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. And the things he was requiring was that they live the law of consecration and establish that program in a in a practical temporal program. But then he says, This cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. For behold, I have prepared a great endowment and blessing to be poured out upon them, inasmuch as they are faithful and continue in humility before me. Therefore, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion. And so having canceled out in that sense, but still continuing to build, but now this time with the emphasis on the spiritual program, then the Lord turned the attention of the brethren uh, to the Kirtland Temple, its completion, and the great endowment that would be poured out at that time. Now, in order to see that, let me go back, beginning with verse section 38 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and let's follow through what the Lord says in the Doctrine and Covenants concerning this anticipated endowment, which is the foundation of Zion, because Zion is not merely a temporal thing. It's rather the extension of the spiritual into the temporal. And you have to have the spiritual in marked degree in order to really carry off the program. Now, in section 38, as we said, the Lord gave the first revelation opening the door for the knowledge of the law of consecration in our time. And in that revelation, having told the brethren that they should esteem their 
their brother as themselves. Then he continues here in verse 31. He says, And that ye might escape the power of the enemy, and be gathered unto me a righteous people, without spot and blameless. Wherefore, for this cause I gave unto you the commandment that you should go to the Ohio, that is, move from New York to Ohio, and there I will give into my law, now that law is the law of consecration, the law of Zion, there I will give into you my law, and there you shall be endowed with power from on high. Now the law and the endowment go together. And then he adds this further comment, and from thence, whosoever I will shall go forth among all nations, and it shall be told them what they shall do. For I have a great work laid up in store for Israel, shall be saved, and I will lead them whithersoever I will, and no power shall stay my hand. So from this revelation, then, they were brought to the to Ohio. He was going to give them the law. He was going to endow them with glory. And this endowment of glory was to be the beginning of the foreign missions of the church. And that's what he's saying. Now, in section 39, he comes back to that same thing. In verse 15, for example, he says, And inasmuch as my people shall assemble themselves in Ohio, I have kept in store a blessing such as is not known among the children of men. And it shall be poured forth upon their heads, and from thence men shall go forth among all nations. Now, here again, those same three basic points, the endowment and the beginning, then, of the foreign missions of the Church. Now turn with me to section 43 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord comes back to this over and over again. In section 43, verse 16, he says, And ye are to be taught from on high, sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be endowed with power, that ye may give even as I have spoken. Let's turn now to section 540, uh, 95 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord again comes back to that. And in the meantime, as you go through the documents of the Church, and I'm not talking about the uh, uh, written documents in the sense of treatises of Church history. I'm talking about the letters, the manuscripts, the communications that were back. And this idea of receiving endowment was spoken of over and over and over again with the intent that they knew and they understood that they were going to have a modern Pentecost and that this was the intent and the purpose of what the Lord was saying. <clears throat> now, in section 95 of the Doctrine and Covenants, he says this, beginning with verse 4, For the preparation wherewith I designed to prepare mine apostles, and this, this is a preparation to teach the gospel. This is a preparation, then, uh, the spiritual endowment is necessary as an endowment to spread forth the gospel message. For example, if I can just interpolate this, when the Kirtland Temple was dedicated, for example, William W. Phelps wrote a, a hymn specially for that occasion. It's called The Spirit of God, Like a Fire is Burning. That's a popular one among Latter-day Saints. One verse of it says this, We will call in our solemn assemblies in spirit, to spread forth the kingdom of heaven abroad, that we through our faith may begin to inherit the visions and glories, missed the word there, something of God. Now, those, that's the purpose the, of, of the solemn assemblies. That's the purpose, then, of the endowments of the Spirit. When I was in the mission field, we had a ten-hour mission, missionary conference. It lasted ten hours without a break. And the Spirit was so concentrated in that meeting that you could almost cut it with a knife. And when we sang the closing song, God be with you till we meet again, I and several others stood there and listened, and a heavenly choir opened up. And they sang with us, and it made the tabernacle choir sound like a, a group of yokels. We went forth out of that conference filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Within the next two months, my companion and I had baptized 32 people and organized the church and started building the chapel. Now, that kind of endowment with the powers of the Spirit that were there, that kind of thing is the thing that we're talking about. And this is the thing Joseph Smith was trying to establish as a basis for building Zion. And this is why it's so important 
that he cleansed thee in a vessel. And this is why it's so important that you wake up spiritually and that we be born of God and ex experience the mighty change President Benson's been talking about. That's why we do it, because this is the basis then of all else. Now the Lord says, For the preparation wherewith I design to prepare mine apostles to prove my vineyard for the last prune my vineyard for the last time, that I may bring to pass my strange act, that I may pour out my spirit upon all flesh. See the great object is expressed there in Article ten of the Articles of Faith. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and the restoration of the ten tribes, that Zion will be built upon this the American continent and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. Now, that's the great objective. And this is what the Lord calls his strange act. And it's accomplished now through gospel principles and teachings and through implementing the Zion program, not something aside from the gospel, but the blossoming of the gospel out into our daily lives and our daily activities. Then he goes on and says, For well, behold, verily I say unto you, there are many who have been ordained among you who I have called, but few of them are chosen. Uh, they who are not chosen have sinned, a very grievous sin, and they have walked in darkness at noonday. And with this cause I gave him to command that you should call a solemn assembly to your fastings in your morning, uh, and your morning might come up into the ears of the Lord of, of Sabaoth, that is, the Lord of the seventh day, which is by... <coughs> Lord of the first day, rather, which is by interpretation the creator of the first day. Yea, verily I say unto you, I give unto you a commandment that you should build a house, into which house I design to endow those with whom I have, cho whom I have chosen with power from on high. And for, for this, then, is the promise of the Father unto you. Therefore I command you to tarry even as mine apostles at Jerusalem. See, some people think that the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem just happened. They just happened to be gathered together in a celebration or commemoration called Pentecost, which was a Jewish holiday. They just happened to be there. And all of a sudden, something happened from heaven, and they were endowed with cloven tongues of fire, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, the prophet Joseph Smith teaches us that the apostles prepared for Pentecost, and he himself prepared for Pentecost. He made a calculated intent to do all those things were necessary with the saints. And this set it in the Kirtland Temple, to complete the temple, get it dedicated, hold a solemn assembly, perform the sacred rites of the priesthood associated with that, and there were those, and then bring the brethren to the point where they could receive a modern Pentecost. This kind of thing just doesn't happen. It's a calculated thing. And when saints then apply themselves as they should and live as they ought, and the gospel program is open to them in its powers, then the end result is a cloud and smoke by day and a flaming of fire by night. Here in the teachings, page 168, for example, the prophet talks about the gospel uh, and what it means. It's not just a system of theology. It's not just a way of life. It's actually... Uh, an order of channel of, of, of channels through which the Spirit is given to the individual, and as we said uh, this morning, through the prophet of the Lord and through priesthood leaders, that there are two channels of the Spirit, one to the individual, the gift of the Holy Ghost, the temple ordinances, and so forth, and then there's another channel, which is that that comes through the living prophet and through your state presidency and through your bishops and through your elders' quorums presidencies. And this channel is the channel that has priority over the first one. If there's a difference between my revelation and the revelation of my state presidency or of my bishop, guess who should move? And the answer is me. Now that's the order of the kingdom, see. And the order of the kingdom isn't just to become great theologians and get theological knowledge. The order of the kingdom is to learn that process or those processes of ministering the Spirit through priesthood leaders and having a brotherhood relationship through priesthood leaders so that together you can have the powers of the Spirit and you can share and enjoy those blessings and grow in the bonds of brotherhood and love 
through the action of the Spirit within that priesthood framework. So the prophet speaking of that says this. He says the apostle Paul perfectly understood the purposes of God in relation to his connection with man. And, note this, and that glorious and perfect order which he established in himself, that is, which God established in himself, whereby he sends forth power, revelations, and glory. Now, there's a way, for example, that you can put a person into possession of the Holy Ghost and give them the personal tutelage of the third member of the Godhead. There's a way to do that. And every missionary knows that way. It's to teach that person to have faith in Jesus Christ and in his work in our day, the restoration and the living prophet, and to repent of his sins and to come down in humility into the waters of baptism by one having proper authority and done in the right way, and then having the laying on of hands. And every time that happens with a sincere and an honest and a conscientious person, that person will get wired up, if I can use that term, to the Holy Ghost. And the power and the gifts and the blessings of the Spirit will be begin to develop in that person. Now, similarly, on a higher plane up here, there is a divine program by which, if we apply, the end result would be that each person and each family in the snowflake state would have a cloud and, and a smoke by day and a flaming of a pillar of fire by night over their dwelling place. And this is a program then involving the development of the gospel. And one day the Latter-day Saints will do that. And when they do that, and not before, they will have Zion. This is Zion, Zion upon her mount, founded upon her temple, and uh, the saints sanctified and given the blessings of the Spirit. See? Now what the, the Lord is saying here then, in connection with this whole thing, is that there is a temporal program he was unfolding at the same time these revelations we've quoted from uh, were given. This temporal program was the law of consecration and stewardship. They ran into a hitch down in Jackson County. And uh, when they got there, then the Lord says, well, let me let you in on a fact. We've been developing these things simultaneously, but I'll let you in on a secret. And that is that you can't really do the temporal fully and completely until you've been endowed with power from on high. And so he says, okay, now let's go and do that. Now, that's 1834. And uh, two years later, less than two years later, then they dedicated the Kirtland Temple. And when they did, they had the gifts and the powers of the Spirit there because they had prepared for Pentecost. And when they went to the solemn assembly and that sacred meeting was held, there was an endowment of the Spirit fire came down, the whole building was enveloped in glory. People could see it for miles and miles away. And this, then, was Zion. Now, as the Lord spoke of that in section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants, this revelation uh, reporting the, the visit of Christ to the Curtain Temple and the coming, then, of Moses and Elias or Noah and Elijah to the Curtain Temple, then the Lord has this to say in verse 8. <coughs> as he promises the saints what he will do if they will perform their part. He says, Yea, I will appear unto my servant and speak unto them with mine own voice, if my people will keep my commandments and do not pollute my holy house. Now, we talked this morning about the benefits of following the living prophet, that there's, there's a channel of power there, and that Zion is endowed with glory and their strength, and their union, and their spiritual power associated with this. And uh, what he's saying now then, if you will really, you will really do your part, then I will appear to your prophet personally and uh, give him direction personally if the people will keep my commandments and do not pollute my holy house. Then he says, Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out, and the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. And then note now verse 10. And the fame of this house shall spread to foreign lands, and this is the beginning, not the high water mark, the beginning of the blessing which shall be poured out upon the heads of my people, even so, amen. Now, Kirkland 
was the beginning. And the end result is when Zion is established, and there's a cloud and smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night over every dwelling place. And then the question is, where are we in between? Where are we? And why have we not built from that level of things right on up? And the reason is that we haven't applied the Lord's commandments as we ought. And the reason is, as President Benson said, we are under condemnation as a church. And we need, in the most serious and critical sense of meaning, to awake spiritually. And not just to awake that we might progress, but there are times that are very, very near. We're standing on the very threshold of these times when there's going to be such disruptions in this land and in foreign lands as we have never seen. Peace will be literally taken from the earth, and we're going to see financial collapse, and we're going to see difficulties and challenges that we've never dreamed of. And unless we have founded our lives to the extent that we ought on the spiritual powers of his gospel, whatever else we have, we are going to fail. Now, it's just that blunt, my brothers and sisters, just that blunt and that meaningful. Now, in this sense, then, the program of Zion then, is an unfolding program, and we need to prepare. Uh, all the words of the Lord, then, must be fulfilled. We all know the Lord's statement that his word will not come back empty and unfulfilled. And yet, as I read the Doctrine and Covenants, there is a very large percent of the Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord gave instructions and commandments that we haven't done anything about. We didn't establish the law of consecration. What happened with the School of the Prophets? It lasted three months in its full power. After that, they had a school, but it wasn't really the full-fledged program. We haven't really come up to the standard, and yet in many ways we've done better than our fathers. And yet at the same time, in the midst of that, we're getting the mentality that Nephi talks about. All is well in Zion. Zion prospers. All is well. And he says, when we get that mentality, that the devil is leading us carefully down to hell. But the point I want to make is this, that these revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants will be fulfilled in full. There will be saints in the latter days who will do everything, finally, that the Lord has commanded. Here's how President Benson sees it. He says, all the words of the Lord will be fulfilled, whether he gives the words himself or whether they come through inspiration and revelation of his servants. As his servants declare these words, the Holy Spirit bears testimony to all who seek to know the truth of the revelations and the commandments. Of late, when I read the Doctrine and Covenants, I deal with a different attitude than I used to. I used to read it for historical purposes, to find out what the Lord said to the Latter-day Saints in those days. The way I read it now is to think and ponder over the issue, what do we really need to do to fulfill the full program of his intent? What do we really do, mean to do in order to finally become a people uh, like the people that he instructed and like they would have become had they obeyed as given in the doctrine of What would we need to do? See? And so you go back and you read it then for its historical purposes, and then you go back and read it because you know that the Lord is going to fulfill all his word. And if that generation didn't do so, then, as the prophet Joseph Smith once said, a future generation will. Now, the gospel then, and here's from President Benson, he says, For the righteous, the gospel provides a warning before a calamity, a program for the crisis, a refuge for each disaster. Here's another one. The revelation to store food may be as essential to our, to our temporal uh, salvation today as boarding the ark was to the people in the days of Noah. And uh, you have him saying, for example, here in this statement, 
The church of the ch the strength of the church welfare lies in every family following the inspired direction of the church leaders to be self sustaining. Through adequate preparation, God intends for his saints to be so prepared to so prepare themselves that the church, as the Lord has said, and this is section seventy eight, verse thirteen to fourteen, may stand independent above all other creatures beneath the celestial world. And uh, as the Lord puts it there, he puts it this way, I think I can quote it. He says, Notwithstanding the tribulation which shall come, implying that this thing is in preparation for a difficult time, notwithstanding the tribulation which shall come, that the saints may stand independent above all other creatures beneath the celestial world. Now, independent means that I, as a person, I'm master of my concerns. I'm out of debt. I don't owe anyone. I've got my feet spiritually established on the gospel. I love my bishop. I love and honor and sustain in acts of dedication and sincerity my state presidency. I love the prophet. I pray for him daily. I have a witness in my life and my soul that he is in very deed God's oracle on earth. And the fire of that testimony goes clear down to the depths of my soul. See? Now, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, he goes on and says, And President Brigham Young said, If you are without bread, how much wisdom can you boast? And uh, what real utility are your talents? If you cannot procure for yourselves and save against a day of scarcity, uh, those substances designed to sustain your natural lives. If you cannot provide for your natural lives, how can you expect to have wisdom to obtain eternal lives? Then, President Benson, when will all these calamities strike? He says, we uh, do not know the exact time, but it appears that it may be in the not too far distant future. Those who are prepared now have the continuing blessings of the uh, early obedience, and they are ready. Noah built his ark before the flood came, and he his fa and his family survived. Those who waited to act until after the flood came were too late. And with that act, Noah became the world's Jake Finn and Sir. He floated his stock where everyone else got theirs liquidated. <laughs> now, I'd like to, after we have a little break, to move into the prophetic picture in light of what we've said and uh, kind of develop not just the fact that difficulties come, but see if we can see some sequence of things and see in some measure where we are. Uh, so why don't we take some of the questions that we've got at this point, and then uh, we'll take a break, and then we'll come back to the more prophetic aspects of our discussion this evening. Question, what did you mean, and it wasn't me, it was Joseph F. Smith, by false educational ideas. Well, let me just be brazen. As I've said, I've got four college degrees, three of which are in the social sciences with a major in political science. And uh, the situation, as I see it, is of such a nature that a person who gets a Ph.D. in political science today gets a Ph.D. in that which is tantamount to perversion. We're that far off base. Now, there are individuals, thank the Lord, who are honest, they're struggling, they're striving to do the best they can. And so the uh, uh, question, the issue then, isn't uh, totally devoid of some uh, meritorious things. But, uh, well, just let me give you an illustration. Back about the turn of the century, uh, in the 1920s, American intellectuals responded to the uh, British school coming out of Oxford, uh, leading into what we call the socialization of the state and the secularization of the state. And uh, in America, one of the landmark studies was done by Charles A. Beard, and it was called The Economic uh, History of the Constitution or something like that. And uh, the approach that he made was simply this. 
that uh, the American Constitution, going back to the Convention of Philadelphia in 1787, the American Constitution essentially was born of social and economic factors. But there was no idealism there. There was nothing but just raw economics and the interest of the various colonies in their own economic interests. Now, rather interestingly, that whole theme gets picked up and became, in one way or another, the dominant theme of American educational institutions. And this continued on until around 1950. A prominent professor at uh, Harvard University by the name of Clinton Rossiter wrote a book called The Seed Time of the Republic, in which he analyzed the origins of American society. And uh, that is in the colonial period of time, and demonstrated through uh, empirical analysis that idealism and ideology had a major role to play in, uh, the Const in the American Revolution and in the formation of the Constitution. He got a Pulitzer Prize for his work. Then later, a woman by the name of Carolyn Robbins picked up a theme that even specialists in the field never treated. This theme was to uh, discuss, follow through, and show the development the results of a group of Englishmen called the English Commonwealthmen. These Englishmen were those who picked up the ideas of the Puritan Revolution of the 1640 to 1660 period, when the Puritans deposed Charles I and sought to establish the Puritan uh, Commonwealth and finally then failed, and Charles II was put back on the throne in 1660. But uh, it was in this period, in this period of 1640 and a little earlier, going back to about 1615 actually, that those ideas that were planted in America and that went into the making of American society and the American constitutional system of government were born. And these English commonwealthmen were so committed to those ideas of freedom that they perpetuated a school for three generations of writers that brought them from the mid-17th century up to the American Revolutionary period. Now, that group of men was totally lost to history and what they did. They didn't have any impact on the... Uh, legislation of the uh, English government, but Carolyn Robbins demonstrated what they taught and what they did. And she also demonstrated that when you come to America, you find that the American colonists responded heartily to what they said. And in fact, they were the men who fed the American revolutionary mind. Now, with this work, which was an important one, a more recent one by another Harvard University professor by the name of Bernard Balin, in which he studies the polemic literature, that is, the tracts and the pamphlets, from about uh, uh, 1660 on up through to uh, the formation of the American Constitution. And uh, he studied 500 main ones and then another thousand that were not quite so important. And he found, as he studied those 1,500 tracts and pamphlets by people who wrote and who communicated to the American mind and who incited them with the feelings of patriotism and love of country, he found that the men that they most often quoted was the English Commonwealthmen. And he found also that the American Revolution was strictly and fully, without equivocation and qualification, an ideological conflict, and that it was out of this ideological conflict that the American Revolution emerged, and it was out of that ideolog ideology that had been founded and established that the American Constitution was written, and that the Burdian School was simply, in a bombastic way of speaking, a bunch of bunk, and yet it has dominated. American society. 
It has dominated the intellectual world of America and of the world and primarily uh, of collectivist countries. Now, for the last ten years, I spent my time, I'm talking about five o'clock in the morning, until I bug out and the walls began to fade in and out on me, and then living in the beautiful town of Alpine, my wife and I take a little time in the afternoon and walk up and look for deer and go through the brush and get about a four or five mile run on things, at least a three or four mile run, and uh, get a little refreshed and come back and, and hit the old computer again. I've done that sitting on a folding chair every day for six days a week for eight years without an exception, except to just go away as I'm down here. And the idea then is to go back and to reanalyze the origins of America. Hopefully one day I'll give birth to a book called The Revolution Called Liberty. Go clear back to the Renaissance and bring the origins of liberty on up through to the Puritan Revolution and from there. And the findings, and this is an overwhelming evidence on this issue, is that our liberty came from Jesus Christ and from the Holy Spirit. That's where we got it. We didn't get it from some philosopher. There's a group of individuals who so committed themselves to Christ and the Holy Spirit, and through their faith and repentance were able to get the Spirit of the Lord, that they devised uh, ecclesiastical organizations based on covenant and commitment and honor and respect to the individual. And then they took those ideas from the religious community and they transferred them into political thought. And then, like the great John Locke and like the English Commonwealthmen, were actually quoting these original liberal Puritans in their efforts. And our liberty then comes from three basic things. Number one, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, from the living commerce that people had with the Holy Spirit. And number three, from the doctrine that they taught. Now, I'm not talking about Ezra Taft Benson now, but they taught that we need to be born of God, that we need to awaken spiritually and enter into a newness of life in which Christ then is in us, and we through the powers of the Spirit are in him. And they develop those ideas to the point that, birth, that there is a birth of freedom. And then those free ideas were perpetuated by the English colonists, and they were planted in America, and they finally grew and they blossomed in the Constitution of the United States. Now, you tell me what we mean by false educational ideas. You tell me how far we are hitting the mark. I've been through, clear on up through to the Ph.D. I never learned this in any, any, any class. I never had a professor set me down and teach me these doctrines. Never. Not one. All I got was the rubbish that we fed America on for the last hundred years. And as a result of it, we've got an educational program and an attitude among people where we are going bankrupt spiritually and morally, and where we are trying to get God out of everything that relates to the state, rather than separating the functions of the church and the state, we're trying to separate God from the state and become an atheistic culture. Now, you tell me what we mean by false educational ideas. Well, that's my tirade for the evening. That's number two, I think. Uh, Matthew 24 and 40, two in the field, the one should be taken and the other left. Two women should be grinding the mill, one should be taken. Is this uh, next city of Zion or the city of Zion itself? It's neither. This statement by the Savior applies to his coming in his glory. And as he opens the veil and he makes his appearance in his glory, then the last great gathering of the righteous will be done by angels. And there will be two at the mill, and one will be taken. And there will be two in the field, and one will be taken, and the other left. And they'll be taken and caught up to meet him in the cloud. Is there a particular type of economy that is most compatible with the Zion society? Some people used to ask me, Brother Andrews, is the law of consecration capitalistic? And I would say no. Is the law of consecration socialistic? I would say no. Is the law of consecration communistic? I'd say no. And then they'd scratch their head and say, well, what is it? And I'd say it's united orderist. Uh, it's a critter all by itself. It's like me. There's not another homely person like me on earth. See? It's, it's an animal all of itself. Instead of being founded upon mere free enterprise economics, 
It's founded on covenant. It's not founded on socialism. It's not founded on, on communism. Now, we've had some experiments in the history of the church that had run communal, this thing we call Orgerville down here in Utah, was simply nothing more than Christian communism. If I'd have been there, I'd been run the rebels in the community. Good thing I wasn't. But uh, it's simply a system of community of, of, uh, of uh, Christian communism. Or it is the free market economy with its accompanying business cycles with labor layoffs compatible with Zion. The answer is no. Free market society in Christ, sanctified in Christ, with the infusion of his Holy Spirit, with the infusion of the idea of treating your brother as yourself, with the stability that comes from divine revelation, that's the picture. It's not the cycle picture. All right, will a Zion society developing in Africa have to be will a Zion society developing out of have to westernize and industrialize? Will Americans have to be reindustrialized? Americans are going to have to repent, and so will everyone else. It isn't a matter of industrializing; it's a matter of repenting. Will there be sinners in the future society, uh, Zion society? And the answer may be yes, and they may lose their stewardship and be and be cast out of the system because of their failure to uphold the covenants they've entered into. Without opposition and evil, will the necessary conditions exist that individuals born in society be tested and overcome evil? We did fight the war in heaven in order to face evil and temptations, didn't we? Well, some people think that when the millennium is here, that there will be no opposition. And uh, I had a good brother in our priesthood quorum. He gets up and preaches that. And uh, as we were walking out of the room, I put my arm loving around his neck and wrestled him a little bit and, and said, I'd like to ask you a question. And he said, Okay. And I says, Who challenged Abraham the most, the devil or the Lord? Now you think of that. And he knew what I was talking about. The Lord gave him the worst time of his life, it wasn't the devil. And uh, then I just cited him, you know, the scriptural statement that the Lord is a refiner's fire, and he's going to refine and purify people. And some people say, well, the Lord's, uh, the devil's not going to be here in the millennium. I say, so, I say, so what? The Lord's going to be here. <clears throat> now, it's not on the same principle, but the Lord is a refiner's fire. And uh, on the other hand, he will... We will be raised to a spiritual plane where it's, where it'll be essentially a new ball game. But we're not contemplating the millennium as a peaceful society without any kind of opposition, or without any dynamics, or or without any challenge. I mean, this is naive. Well, we've gone way overhand, and I'm just going to say, the Lord bless you. And let's have a, about five minutes, and we'll get back to the prophetic picture. Thank you.